Hello and welcome back for the final installment in this lecture. It is a review of linear algebra in order to help us with the advanced mathematics topics that we're gonna encounter in our advanced mobile robotics class for autonomous vehicles. So recall that so far we have reviewed vectors and the results of multiplying scalars by vectors as well as the dot product of vectors. We've also reviewed matrices operations and properties such as vector times matrix and a dot product as well as the multiplication of matrices and today's lecture is all about matrix transformations and how we can use these for transforming the reference frame for a robot moving in a world So the first term we want to define is the matrix rank. The rank of a matrix is the maximum number of linearly dependent rows or columns in a matrix. The rank of an M by N matrix is going to be greater than or equal to zero, where it would only be zero if you have a null matrix. And it would have full rank if the rank matches the dimensions of the minimum number of rows or columns. If you have a square matrix, then the full rank would be the same size as either the number of rows or the number of columns. The rank of a matrix of an M by N matrix must be less than or equal to the minimum of the number of rows or the number of columns. To compute the rank of a matrix, you can use Gaussian elimination and count the number of non-zero rows. Our next definition is the inverse of a matrix. So let's say we have the product of two matrices, A times B, which equals the identity matrix. Remember the identity matrix has ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So if a matrix A has a full rank AB equal I, then it is possible to find the unique solution to this problem where B would be equal to A inverse. The ith row of A and the jth column of A for A inverse are said to be orthogonal or their dot product is zero if I is not equal to J and it is one if I is equal to J. The next term we're going to define is the determinant. So for a matrix determinant, it is only defined for a square matrix. And remember, square matrix means the number of columns is equal to the number of rows. So the inverse of the matrix exists for this matrix only if it has full rank, which means that the determinant of A is not equal to zero. And for this definition, the inverse of the matrix is defined as A times A inverse, which will equal the identity matrix. So for a two by two matrix, here is an example of how you would find the determinant. If the elements are A11, A12, A21, and A22, it's the product of the first and fourth element minus the product of the second and third element. It also looks like a cross, and that's how most people remember this. With numeric values, you would have the matrix one, two, three, four has a determinant found from one times four minus two times three, or four minus six, which is negative two. However, this starts to get a little bit more complicated for larger matrices. So finding the determinant without some kind of mathematical software becomes kind of unwieldy. For example, the start to doing this would be to find the sub matrix for a three by three AIJ would be what matrix do you get if you delete the ith row and the jth column? So here, if I remove the second row and the first column, then my sub matrix A21 is 2389. The determinant of the matrix for a larger matrix we can find by generalizing by using that the determinant of A is A11 times the determinant of the sub matrix minus A11 times the determinant of the sub matrix A12 and so on. We can write this in compact form, compact form as the determinant of A is the summation from J equals one to N of negative one to the one plus J 
A1J determinant of the submatrix A1J, where the cofactors of matrix A for IJ could be written as CIJ is equal to negative one to the one plus J times the determinant of the submatrix A1J. So the cofactor expansion of matrix A across the first row could then be given as, in terms of the cofactors, the determinant of A, A11 times C11 plus A12 times C12 and so on, or the summation from J equals one to N, A1J, C1J. For larger matrices, it's easier and faster to just do Gaussian elimination because then once you have this triangular matrix, you can find the determinant of that matrix simply by finding the product of the diagonal elements as shown here. What are some properties of a matrix determinant? Well, one of them is for the transpose, which means that the determinant of A is the same as the determinant of A transpose. The second one is for multiplication. So the determinant of A times B is the same as the determinant of A times the determinant of B. And for row operations, if you swap one set of rows, the determinant of B, the result of that row exchange, will equal the negative determinant of A. Or if you multiply matrix A by a scalar and B is equal to CA, then the determinant of B is going to be C times the determinant of A. And finally, if B is the result of adding and multiplying rows of matrix A, or in other words, creating a linear dependent matrix based upon the first matrix, then the, the determinant of B will be the same as the determinant of A. Now let's talk about an orthogonal matrix. A matrix Q is said to be orthogonal if and only if its column vectors represent an orthonormal basis. What does this mean? It means that if I have Q star I transpose and Q star J in a matrix, they will only be one if I equals J. Otherwise, that dot product would yield a zero if I does not equal J. So there are some properties of orthogonal matrices that we're going to use in the future that will prove to be very helpful, in particular when we talk about rotation matrices for transforming robots in an open world. So the transpose of an orthogonal matrix is its inverse. So QQ transpose, which would be the same as QQ inverse, is equal to the identity matrix. And the determinant of an orthogonal matrix has unity norm, which basically means that the determinant is a one. So now let's talk about the rotation matrix. A rotation matrix is an orthonormal matrix with a determinant equal to one. So the definition of a 2D rotation matrix is given by, if I wanna rotate by theta, it's cosine theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. When you have a 3D rotation along the main axes, these are given by the rotation about the X axis with respect to theta would be one, zero, zero, zero cosine theta, negative sine theta, zero sine theta, cosine theta. And the rotation about the Y axis with theta would be cosine theta, zero negative sine theta, zero, one, zero, sine theta, zero cosine theta. Note that rotations are not commutative, so you have to do them in order. What about the translation matrix? So a translation matrix is used to represent the rotation of an object in the world, and also how does it translate in 3D? So it takes into account the non-commutative property of transformations where R is the rotation matrix and T is the translation vector. So what does this look like? We have a matrix A where the upper left corner represents the rotation matrix, the upper right rep represents the translation vector, and then the bottom would be zero one. The inverse would then be the upper left is the rotation matrix, the upper right is negative the transpose of the rotation matrix times T, and the bottom row is still zero one. 
where we would represent a point or a pose in the world for the robot as T1 as a vector. So here's what this looks like. So matrix A represents the pose of the robot in space. B represents the position of a sensor on the robot. And the sensor perceives an object at a given location P. Note that the sensor is in its own reference frame, which means it has no context of its location in the global reference frame. So the question is, where is the object in the global reference frame? Note here that the global reference frame is represented by the X and Y axes. To solve for the location of the object in the global reference frame, you must chain together the transformations of the robot with respect to the global reference frame and the sensor with respect to the robot, and then the sensor location with respect to the sensor, and then the object location with respect to the sensor. So the pose of the object with respect to the robot reference frame would be BP, because notice that the B matrix is the sensor location with respect to the robot, and then the P vector is the location of the object with respect to the sensor. So to solve for the location of the object in the global reference frame, we also need to chain this together with the location of the robot with respect to the global reference frame, which we're calling matrix A. So the pose of the object with respect to the world or global reference frame would now be A, B, P. Let's look at another example. So if I know that the 2D pose of a robot in terms of the global coordinate frame is written as X1, Y1, theta one, where X1, Y1 denotes the position in the coordinate plane of the robot and theta one is its orientation, then this is what my figure looks like. At this pose, we will assume that the robot detects a landmark that is at position LX, L1 with respect to the robot's local reference frame. So we need to have a transformation matrix T that shows the pose of the robot with respect to the global reference frame. So this would be T of A, the robot's location with respect to G, cosine theta one, negative sine theta one, X one, sine theta one, cosine theta one, Y one, zero, zero, one. Then we need to have a vector that shows the landmark with respect to the robot reference frame A. And so this would be L with respect to A is LX, LY one. So now we have to cascade matrices together to get the landmark with respect to the global reference frame. And it would be given by the landmark with respect to the global, global reference frame is the transformation of A with respect to the global reference frame times the landmark with respect to A. How about another example? What if the landmark coordinates are given with respect to the global reference frame instead of with the robot reference frame or local reference frame? How could you then calculate the coordinates that the robot was sensed in its local reference frame for that landmark. So the landmark's location with respect to the local reference frame A would then be the transform of the global reference frame with respect to A times the landmark with respect to the global reference frame, which means that you have to take the inverse of the transformation matrix, which is the robot with respect to the global reference frame times the landmark's location with respect to the global reference frame. So now let's think about what happens if the robot now moves and the robot has now moved from position A at X1, Y1, theta one to position B at X2, Y2, theta two, both with respect to the global reference frame. What is the new pose of the robot with respect to A and where does it perceive the landmark? So this would be a transformation matrix of B with respect to A, where we now would just take the global reference frame with respect to A transformation matrix and the location of B with respect to the global reference frame transformation and multiply those together. So that would be the same as the inverse 
of the transformation, transformation matrix of the first position of the robot with respect to the global reference frame times the second position of the robot with respect to the global reference frame. So now the question is at location B, where is the landmark with respect to the robot's new local reference frame? You would find that by having the landmark with respect to B as the transversion matrix of location A with respect to location B times the location of the landmark with respect to location A. And another way of stating that would be that the transfer matrix of B location with respect to A location inverse times the landmark location with respect to position A of the robot. And here is how you would create the transformation matrix of the robot at position B with respect to the location of the ro robot's position A. You would have the global reference frame with respect to position A. And then you would have the robot's position at B with respect to the global reference frame. And then you would find the inverse of the robot's position at A with respect to the global reference frame inverse times the transformation of the robot's position at B with respect to the global reference frame. I know this is a lot. I hope you're following, okay? It's really just matrix math, but you gotta always understand how it looks in the context of either the larger world or the robot as it's moving around the world. And with that, we are done. So we are all done with lecture 1-1, which is a hyper fast review of linear algebra, but only the parts in the context of what we're gonna need for where we're going next. And where we're going next is forward and inverse kinematics on a mobile robot. And you have to be able to do rotations and translations to understand how to get the robot from point A to point B. I hope you've enjoyed and have a robotastic day.